praise God this wonderful morning. I'm glad to be alive and I hope you are. Thank you each and every one of you who has managed to be here. And also thank you brother Emmanuel for inviting me to come and uh, share with us. And I believe that uh, we have been blessed so far. So as we begin, I want to invite each and every one of us that you bow down together with me, even as we have a word of prayer. Ancient of days, and our heavenly Father, to your humble abode, we bring our petitions this morning. We realize our weaknesses and it's of surety that it's only you who can turn them into strength. Here we are, miserable, poor, wretched and blind, asking Lord that uh, you may fill us with the Holy Spirit, that he may direct our steps in everything that we do. And above all, Lord also, that you may give us understanding. I am just but a vessel of clay. The same words that you put in your servant Jeremiah, may you also touch my lips that whatsoever I speak may be from you. Let your blessings abound to each and every one of us. For this we plead, believing and trusting in Jesus' name. Amen. Our sharing this morning is yet there is room. Yet there is Rome. The scriptures are the great agency for the transformation of character. If studied and obeyed, the word of God works in the heart, subduing every unholy attribute. The religion of the Bible is the only safeguard for the young. And so as we get to reflect more on the life of Jesus Christ in his inspired word through the writings of the spirit of prophecy, we become more and more like him. And we elucidate this light to others who are also groping in darkness. I want us to turn to our Bibles in the book of Luke, chapter 14, and we shall read from verse 15. Luke was a doctor. The Bible calls him in the book of Colossians 4, I believe, verse 14. Uh, the beloved physician, he was a beloved medical missionary. So it doesn't matter what profession you have. Even if you are a doctor, even if you are an engineer, even if you are a lawyer, all of us can serve our master. All of us can do something to advance the cause of Jesus Christ. As much as we, we, we are learned, uh, I believe I was reading somewhere in the book, Lift Him Up, uh, it says that, Everything that we gain by education was meant that we use it for the advancement of the gospel. So no matter profession which you have, God deigned and ordained that we use it in the spread of the everlasting gospel. And so here we find Dr. Luke telling us that indeed, yet there is room. I'm reading from verse 15. The Bible says, 
And when one of them that sat at meat with him had these things, he said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then said he unto him, A certain man made a great supper and bade many. And he sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. And the first one said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground and I, go, I'm, I, I, I must needs go and see it. I pray thee have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I go to prove them. I pray thee have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. And the servant came and shielded his Lord all these things. And the master being angry said unto his servant, go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it's done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. Friends, as we begin to get a few insights from this parable by Jesus Christ, first of all, I love how the man starts off by saying that blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. And we are not waiting until we get to heaven that such that we may eat bread. We have the bread now. The Bible says that Jesus Christ is the bread of life. And so we can eat it now. And as we eat this bread, as we uh, study from the scriptures for the bible says in the book of john 5 verse 39 search the scriptures for in them you think that they you have eternal life and they are they which testify of me we are eating bread already in the kingdom of god and so jesus puts this parable to this man and uh, many times when i look at the parables jesus is always addressing one individual and uh this morning, I want you to be in a position saying, Jesus, please speak to my heart. You're not speaking to everybody. You're speaking only to me. And so the Bible says that a certain man made a great supper. And this certain man is not just a, a figment of imagination. He's not somebody that is hidden, but it's God, our father, who has made a great supper. And for him to make a great supper, he did not uh, call upon our efforts. It was out of his own heart that he saw that he may make a great supper. And when he did this, he sent out his servant. He sent out his son and our Lord, Savior Jesus Christ, that he may invite us to this supper. Jesus Christ came to this world, incarnated. He lived the life of a poor man. He suffered every form of abuse. He was persecuted. And at the end of the day, we crucified him on the cross of Calvary. He paid the death which was ours. He died the death which was ours, that we may have life which was not ours. He, he, he has done everything on his part that we may have life in him. And so as he comes, he goes out to those who were bidden. And I believe these were first the Jews. And uh, we are told that 
all this with one consent, they began to make excuse. I don't know how they managed to do this because I believe during those times there were no cell phones, but it means like they had uh, kind of like a, a group of passing information from one to another. And they said that when this invitation come, all of them with one consent, they started making an excuse of why they should not come. Friends, Jesus Christ has made a wonderful promise in the book of John chapter 14. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I will not have told you. Jesus went to prepare a place for us. And he tells us so plainly in scripture that it cannot be mistaken. It's not prophetic that there are many mansions in his humble abode. And uh, I have never stayed in a mansion. And I believe uh, if you have stayed in a mansion in this life, it is not comparable to the mansion in heaven. Maybe you are staying in a single room. Maybe you are staying in a bed sitter. Maybe you are staying in that one thatched roof house. But there is a sweet, sweet promise that in heaven, all of us shall be staying in mansions. And that is why God says very clearly that there is room in his house. But what can we do? We make excuses. And so the first one said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground and I must needs go and see it. The second one said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I go to prove them. Is it the affairs of this life that are preventing you from coming to Jesus Christ? Is it your career? Is it your job commitments? Is it, uh, is it your education that is preventing you to come from to Jesus Christ? What is this that is so holding you tightly that you have no room for Jesus? Mm -hmm. That in your heart, you do not want to heed the call of coming to him. I believe the greatest discovery an unbeliever can make is that Jesus Christ died for him. But the greatest discovery a believer can make is that he is crucified with Jesus Christ. And this discovery will bring to an end all self-effort. It will make us realize that there is no excuse of not coming to Jesus Christ. We'll not be looking for excuses. You'll not be saying that, oh, my child. You'll not be saying, oh, my boss at work. But you'll be saying, I have bidden and I must needs be there at that very, very moment. And so the Bible continues to say, then another said, I married a wife and therefore I cannot come. I believe of all those who gave excuses, this one was the most appalling. It was the most, I can say, the most rude of all excuses. All this man had simply to do was to tell his wife, there's a supper we have been invited to, let us go. And there is a tendency that when people are united in holy matrimony, you immerse your individuality in the other person, such that if the other person does this, that is the same, same thing you do. But we are warned and we are told in the spirit of prophecy, especially in the book Adventist Home, that as much as we are one flesh in holy matrimony, it is not the reason for you to immerse your individuality in another. And so it looks like this man loved his wife so dearly, he had immersed his individuality in his wife, and therefore 
he gives us an excuse of not coming to Jesus Christ, his wife. Friend, anybody who begins to compete with the highest place in your heart for the position of first place, which should be God's, should immediately be removed from that place. I told my wife before we got married, and I say to her very plainly and very clearly that you are my second love. My first love is Jesus Christ. And so she knows that very clearly. And we, you and I need to come to that place whereby we make that very clear. And so as the scripture goes down, all these people refused and the servant comes and reports to Jesus Christ telling him this is what and what they have said. And the master of the house being angry. And this is where I want us to see the love of God. This is where I want us to see the beauty of following Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, yes, he is angry, but he is not angry that he may injure us. But his anger is an anger born out of good intentions, born out of love. And he goes out and tells uh, this master, go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in hitter, the poor and the maimed, the halt and the blind. And so the servant went and that is what Jesus Christ did. He has been doing all along this while. He has been calling those who are ready to accept the call and they have been coming in. Then, yet there is room. Lord, it's done as thou hast commanded and yet there is room. Friend, my humble appeal to you this morning there is still room in Jesus' house. You need to create room in your heart for Jesus Christ. The doors are not yet closed. The house is not yet filled. And he's saying to you and to me, yet there is room. He's inviting us to come. And he's saying, I still have vacancies in my cabinet. We have been looking at uh, the theme, he has never been voted out. And this man whose term has never come to an end, there are still positions in his cabinet that only you and only you can fill them up. Nobody else can take those positions. And there is no point in time we'll say that these positions are so full, there is no position for you. He's saying that there is a position for each and every one of us. And so my friend, this morning, I want us to realize that yet there is room. There is a seat available for you. And if you have not yet made your place sure in that kingdom, I invite you this morning that you may make it sure. If that is your prayer and your longing that indeed you may occupy that position. You may not refuse the invitation, but rather you will accept it. I want you to bow down your head even as we pray together. Thank you, dear Lord, for reminding us this morning that indeed there is room. No excuse which you can bring will be acceptable in thy sight. But let us realize with solemnness that you came to this world and that you love saving each and every one of us. And therefore you tell us that there is room. There is somebody here who is saying this morning, Lord, I want my position to be assured. May this be our prayer and our song always and forevermore.
for this we pray, believing and trusting in the holy name of Jesus Christ.